Okay, we got. I've got it going. Okay, so we're we're going to, we're going to take a moment for a brief meditation, and I want you all to uh, relax, allow your eyes to gently close. If you have things on your lap, you might want to put them aside, and just to, um, allow your body to relax. Let yourself go within. Go where you go, when you go, to that special place. Welcome back. We are so blessed to have Tony with us today. Tony has um, been a guest speaker for Chicago Iron several times before, and every time has been wonderful. Um, I particularly uh, was excited when I learned that Tony was an Illinois state prosecutor for 27 years because to have someone who has that kind of knowledge and that kind of experience also know and understand the association with the other side and she did it through her near-death experiences which uh, she be mean to us. I don't know exactly how far we'll get with that. But, um, her several of her books. Uh, she, she interviewed um, people on the other side, and the first time somebody told me, "Oh, I, there's a slave," right. <laughs> you know, and then I I got one of them to the books and read it, and I could feel the energy 
coming through the pages and I knew without question that this is real. And then I proceeded to read everything that she had published. And, and then I called her and I, um, I had a reading with her and I invited her to speak. And uh, I don't know, that's about 20 years ago, I think. Uh, and ever since she's been a uh, guiding star to Chicago Irons. And so uh, we came up with this idea of, of um, letting her do some of these interviews from the other side live with us. And this is uh, something we have not done before, but we're very excited to have her do that. So, um, Please give a warm welcome to Tony Winninger. <laughs> Tony, you're on. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to see that uh, so many of you are staying in out of the wind and rain today to uh, enjoy our session. This is uh, a little different than any way I have done before. When I have been at IONS before, people would from the audience uh, ask questions and most of the questions were concerning their own personal problems. Uh, what I have done in several different locations where I have gone um, most recently in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, they set up a situation where I did an open channeling for I guess what you would call famous people on the other side. And so we decided to do that today. Now, in other times when I've set up this type of a situation, we have contacted the people on the other side beforehand and a number of them have agreed to participate. We, because of the names that were brought up this time, we just decided to go and see how it works. Now, spirits on the other side will answer about 90% of all the questions asked of them. They won't answer a question if they think you don't need to know it or if it interferes with somebody's freedom of choice. It is much easier for me to contact those that have been over on the other side for a longer period of time. But several of the names that have been mentioned, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and John Lewis, I have contacted them through my guides and they have both consented to answer questions. Uh, the, other people that come through all the time when I do these sessions are like George Washington, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Joan of Arc, Mother Mary, Jesus, a lot of the different religious figures. Now, what has to occur in a situation like this is somebody ask me the question and the only way that I can get a good answer from the other side is by clearing my mind completely of my thoughts. So the way we had talked about setting it up was somebody would just read me the question submitted by people and I would channel through what I hear. So if we have no preliminary questions before we begin, we could start. Um, Tony, I, ha I have a question. Yes. I wanna know why Ruth died three months before Biden get, got in office. <laughs> okay, well, I'm hearing a lot of laughter from the other side. I'm sure. And she said it would <laughs> seem as if it was too much of just an already agreed upon puzzle being put together instead of a scenario which allowed for the whole world or the, the whole United States to be a participant. 
she would have liked to have stuck around, but in afterthought, she decided that it was her time to move on, that she had been a shaper of so many things that had occurred within the last several decades, that it was time for the people to realize their importance and where they fit into the whole overall framework of what, and she's laughing, may be called a democracy and may no longer be called a democracy because right. of what is currently happening. But it is for those who are going to be around and who are going to be making the rules and going to be creating the next framework to make the decisions and not for her using her experience, which she said comes from generations. It is for the time right now. What does the world, what does the United States, what do the people who vote, what do they want? How do they want to shape things? So for that reason, she said she had to step aside. And as a little aside, she's saying, and you can see with the decision that came down last night, that already people are having their toes put to the fire. Yes, that's wonderful. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, if anybody else has questions, please write them on the chat tablet. And uh, do you want to look at the ta uh, the tablet, Tony, or do you want no, me to? No, I want okay. somebody to read them to me. Because if I look at something, I have to engage my brain in order to read. Okay, good. So I, I will read the questions. Um, somebody's got to type some questions first. There's nothing here. I've got Craig working on one. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of it. Okay. You want to just say it? Sure. Uh, Tony, I used to be really interested in astrology, you know, and it's not that I lost interest, but I wasn't following it like I did, uh, especially during the harmonic convergence in 1987. And so I recently went on the internet and started reading what astrologers were saying about all these conjunctions and all these dramatic changes and how this year 2020 is like no other. And that you know, all this conflict and anger and stuff is going on and that you know, we, we won't probably start to see a real shift into the age of Aquarius. Because I remember in the late 60s, or, you know, the song, The Dawn of the Age of Aquarius, it seems like now we're actually finally there. So what does that all really mean? I mean, some people have this idea that we hit the age of Aquarius and everything will be bliss and perfect. Astrologers saying that's not the case. So what are they saying about this major shift that's taking place cosmically? Astrology is the influence of the planetary masses upon the living, breathing, physical being of each individual. The influence from the, the time of your birth and the, all the transits and positions of the planets impacts a person only to give them an idea or a tendency to do something. A person born under a particular sign, such as I'm a Scorpio myself, that those are the tendencies which are very easy for me to adopt and adapt to. But that only is if I want to, because as a soul within this physical body, each one of us as total freedom of choice. We can take the easy road and we can go along with the massiveness of the energy that's impacting us from the planets and from our birth time, or we can take it as so much of a 
a suggestion of what we should do. The, and you see it within the political realm right now. Those people who are thinking for themselves and those people who are just getting on board with some type of a movement and not really making any choices of their own, but allowing themselves to be directed. That's just like the energy of the planets. You can get into the slipstream and just cruise down the river with that energy and accept all of it. Or you can go cross current and try to make headway. You can let it take you to another location. You can fight it. It all depends upon your freedom of choice. So it is, as we would say, advisory only. But it does make it much easier, since we're all energetic beings, to go along with what is being presented to us. But no, we have that freedom to accept, reject, go against, or just sit back and observe. Thank you. You're welcome. Th thank you. Uh, put your questions on the chat pad because then, then we can, um, uh, we have a chance to review and so and so forth first. If everyone so, can mute themselves, that'd be great. What? If everyone can mute themselves, that would be awesome. Yes, keep yourselves mute unless you're talking. Um, we have a question uh, for Ruth. What can we do to support the continuation of your work? Well, there are those people who were of the same mindset as I. And there are others who think that I was too radical. Those who think I was too conservative, <laughs> if you might. And I don't think that anybody should blindly follow anyone, whether it's what I decided, what I put my life's work into, or if it is what one political party or one political group does. Everybody should ask themselves, how do I feel about this? Is this what I want my reality to look like? I created a reality that I felt would be a world that my daughters and I could live in. I didn't do it because I wanted to dictate to others. I knew that in my position as a Supreme Court Justice, I wasn't dictating. I was merely interpreting the laws as this country had agreed upon them. The laws as this country had put together and taking into consideration the time frame within which some of those laws were created, finding a way to bring them into the current century the current decade, to explain the way that people now live and people now should be honored and not segregated, not discriminated against. I can't say that the thoughts that I had while in human form were superior to what's going on now, nor that they are what everyone out there once as their reality. So I beseech each person to go inside and to do what is your reality, to express your reality, to consider not only that you need to honor the fact that you are a soul having a physical experience, but that everyone else out there around you is doing the same thing. And some of them are down here in physical form to experience negativity. 
to experience control. Is that part of your reality? If it isn't, find a way around it. If it is, find a way to do it. Thank Yes. 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 Then, uh, Vic Victoria, please. Oh, so this silver one's kind of messed up, so it was really hard to like. So, Ruth is just saying, do what feels right for you. So they can't hear me. They can hear you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. That, that was terrific. We have several other ones here for Ruth, and I think as long as we've got her handy, let's address those first. Um, someone, uh, Kim, actually asks if her spirit is female. Spirits don't have a sex. Uh, a soul is an amorphous amount of energy of unconditional love. The sexes as we know of them in human form are there for many reasons. Some of them is for us to experience procreation, for us to experience physical pleasures. Others is to take up the mantle of what those characteristics mean on the earth. But a soul has no sex. Every soul that has come down to the planet Earth, and you've all been here many, 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 many times, and you've been both sexes. Some have been more male than female, depending upon what lessons you wanted to learn, but you have been both. I have been both. As you can tell by some of the characteristics I had when I was an attorney, there were many times when I was a male authority figure. And I used that as a basis for developing my persona within the law field that allowed me to finally be nominated to the Supreme Court. So you take both energies within yourself, within your energy, and remember some of the characteristics you had within each one of your lifetimes and then use those in subsequent lives. But souls are sexless. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very, very much. Um, another question for you, Ruth. What do you think about your replacement in the, on the Supreme Court? <laughs> I think it's too early to tell. Uh, one thing is very sure, she has adopted the political way of not answering questions. And so that does not give you a chance to see where she's going. However, the way she has not been easily manipulated as it was believed she would be gives hope, but freedom of choice will tell. I can't predict uh, what's going to happen. Uh, there are those who are predicting a financial crash for this country and or worldwide. Is a financial crisis coming and what can we do about it? This question can be asked of anyone you are contacting today. All right, there's a, a whole number of people that are participating in this answer. And the very <clears throat> first thing and the strongest thing I'm hearing is there's too many variables. There will be terrific financial crises in some countries. There does not have to be in this country based upon how Congress allows things to be handled. If Congress gets behind supporting the people who need help at this time, those whose mortgages are being forecalled, those whose businesses have gone out, 
those who are in the food lines, all of those things can be stabilized so that they do not cause a crisis with a certain percentage of the United States population. Some countries are doing marvelously. Germany is a perfect example where they have gone out and they have given people what they need to maintain themselves. And it is very true of a lot of the Scandinavian countries as well. So a worldwide downfall does not appear to happen. But of course, you can have an evil cabal come in and change the financial uh, situation of any country if given the power. So there's just too many variables to say exactly what's going to happen. Yes, good, thank you very much. Um, Lori asks if you have any insight on the possible energetic shift on December 21st. Well, it's going to be another equinox time and a change of seasons. The, a lot of what is happening energetically when it centers around weather has to do with a combination of the change of seasons, the whole global warming situation, uh, and the energy which is being given out by the people on the planet. The, there are different things which can influence energy. If a lot of people all give out positive energy, they can divert a disaster from occurring. If people want to see destruction occur in a, per, in a particular area, they can put a lot of energy into that and the whole place will blow up. So it is a combination of the planetary influences, the climactic influences, and the energy as expressed by people. There are a lot of groups even here in the United States right now who are fomenting anger, fomenting uh, hatred. If they grow in number without a counterbalancing energy of people trying to diffuse that, there can be a lot of a disturbance. And at times of change, such as the equinoxes and the changes of seasons, it's much more possible for this to have a larger impact because there isn't a, a strong hiding or a, a guarding surrounding the energy that's being burst at it. There again is no positives in this world because every single person has an influence on what happens. Uh, there's a question here that related, it says, will the hate and the divisiveness eventually change? And how do we stop this negativity, this hatefulness and violence? It will change only if the people choose to change. You can't force another individual to do anything they don't want to do. But what you can do is you can direct at them unconditional love. Now, it seems like a misnomer to say, oh, that person is a bigot, a racist, and a white supremacist. Why would I at any time send unconditional love at them? And the answer to that is because hate cannot exist in the presence of love. And if you send energy of love to them, they become so disconcerted that they can stop and taste that change. And if they like it, they'll adopt some of it. And it then lessens the degree 
of hatred and disdain they have for others. And they accept that there's something else beside what they have created for themselves. Um, we've got <clears throat> also change because of the leadership change in the United States, for example. I mean, I think the leader we had had also facilitated this hatefulness, decisiveness. So with a new leader, can that also help to change this? It already is. The way that people are thinking about the future has become much brighter. They no longer see that the answer to everything is, I'm for me and me alone. The new feeling within the United States is getting the most educated, the most informed, the best integrated people into the positions to read the will of the people and the needs of the people. You are going from a situation where you had a person who cared only about himself. There was not an empathetic neuron in that man's body. Now you have people who cry with the public when they are hurting, who know that the public needs help and are finding ways to do it. So yes, there are going to be a lot of big changes. The question is, how much are they going to have to fight for it? And will they be able to surmount some of what seems to be insurmountable? Yeah, like barriers for example, right now. I'm sorry. Um, like one of the questions about Congress, I mean, giving aid to people, how can they do that if, if the Senate is constantly stopping them? Well, there's been a, a change uh, recently. What happens in Georgia, which is totally unpredictable at this time, is going to be very big in how easily this is facilitated. But as many of the Republicans who signed on to that ridiculous Texas lawsuit, as was done, uh, there were as many not quite as many, but almost as many who are getting behind the Democrats. When the last bill was passed for the military, there were more votes bipartisan for that bill so that even if the president vetoes it, they can overwrite the veto. So there is a shift occurring as people are beginning to realize what they have been dealing with and what the possibilities are. Tony, we have a, a lot of questions here about uh, the virus and the pandemic. Um, people are wondering uh, whether the vaccine will be effective or whether it will be dangerous to, to any people. Uh, they're wondering whether it will uh, actually uh, make the changes that we're hoping to see lessen the virus so we can go back to normal. Do you have much information there from Ruth or others? Well, I'm getting it from a, a number of, of different medical people and they are saying that the viruses that are under development, including the Pfizer one, which has been approved for uh, distribution, are much more effective than the standard flu vaccine that we receive every year, are much more effective than the pneumonia vaccine, are much more effective than the shingles vaccine because of the way they were developed using new processes, they have e efficacy ratings of in excess of 90% every one of them. 
Will they be 100% effective on everybody? No, nothing is. Will they be dangerous to some people, depending upon the individual's body, potentially? But what you have to understand is that each and every one of us has a say in that. It is what we accept. If we get a vaccination thinking it's not going to be effective, it won't be. Because we are saying to the vaccine, I don't even want to accept that you're here. Let me have the virus. It's like a family where all of the women have breast cancer and each generation just says, well, I'm going to have it because everybody else has. We invite that pathogen then into our body. If we instead say, I don't need to experience this and so that I don't need to experience it and so that I help it so that I don't experience it, I'm going to get the vaccination and I am going to acknowledge that it is going to be effective on me and that it is going to prevent me from not only getting it, but from me being a spreader to anyone I come in contact with. So it has a lot to do with our mindsets, what we accept. And if we see it positively, it will have a positive effect for you. <clears throat> um, the, uh, let's see, someone asked a question, what is the relationship to this COVID vaccine to the polio shot? How are, are they related, if at all? Not at all. Okay. You don't see any information no, there. there. There's no, it's a totally different process. It's a, a different developmental string. It is, um, polio vaccines, we're dealing with the vaccine itself and neutralizing it, minimalizing it, and then using it either killed or alive as an injectable. This is different. This is using a particle of the coronavirus and using a different developmental process to create the vaccine. Another question for you. Is Mitch McConnell a sociopath? <laughs> well, you can ask a number of psychiatrists a question about whether a person is a sociopath or not. And based upon their education and where they got their training, they will give you different answers. If you take the definition of a sociopath, somebody who is all for themselves and is or concerned with power and maintaining power and being a dictator, then yes, he is a sociopath. If you are looking for a psychiatric definition, there would be a difference of opinion. Another question from Joy, how long will Trump continue to wield so much power and influence over elected Republicans? There are so many variables on that. He will continue to maintain power until he is criminally charged in the state of New York. Will he go to jail? Too many variables. Mm -hmm. Too many variables. Can, can one expect that he will re receive the karmic effect of what he's done at some point? Well, there is no such thing as karma. Karma is something that has been developed by Eastern religions on the planet Earth to justify what people do. Within the spiritual realm, there is no karma. There are consequences within the physical realm for what we do. But that's not karma. It's not something that you have no control over. Will there be repercussions? There are going to be huge repercussions. 
and they are already in the works. General Flynn is asking Trump to suspend the Constitution under secret presidential powers. Is this possible? No. Okay. Um, another question. Are we being visited by extraterrestrials? Mm. Yes. How? Are there a lot of them? Well, it depends upon your definition of what an extraterrestrial is. First off, any non-physical soul who comes and visits, like those who are talking through me today, that is an extraterrestrial visit. If you are talking about a soul who is having an existence on another planet, who is coming down to observe what's going on here on planet Earth, the answer to that is also yes. But whether they make themselves visible or not is something else. All souls have immense curiosity. When we are down here in a physical body, we have curiosity and plans based upon what we decided to do before coming down here and what we want to learn. When we choose to have an existence someplace other than on planet Earth, it depends upon what reason we're choosing to do that. Are we choosing to do that to uh, expand some characteristic like debate philosophy, uh, invent things, see how physical the body can be, or if we just want to experience energy a planet that's all electricity? Or do we want to observe history in a semi-physical state? Now we can observe the history of this planet that we've spent so many lifetimes on by visiting it in a different form, but in a semi-physical form. Now they're saying the reason why they would do that is if you are a soul you can be in many places at the same time. All you have to do is wherever you put your, your consciousness, that's where you are. If you dedicate yourself to be, uh, uh, they say, say a Martian. If you dedicate yourself to being a Martian, you do that so that you can concentrate on one thing. And as a Martian, your thing might be to follow the political history of the United States in year 2020. You can't do that if you're all over the place, if you're being able to visit everywhere, but you can do that if you can just perch yourself, say on the Capitol, and watch all of the beams that are drifting around from there. So yeah, there's a lot of aliens around, but there's different kinds of aliens. Are there any Negative, evil aliens around? No. There are a few negative spirits that are still hanging around that haven't crossed over, but they aren't aliens. Who would they be? Well, they aren't people that you necessarily know. They're just people who were uh, very negative. They came down to planet Earth just to have negative experiences and when it came time for them to leave, uh, they weren't ready to go because they had to get revenge against those they felt wronged them and they stick around. But there aren't any, uh, what you would call famous people that are still doing that right now. So that's what we would call a ghost? No, uh, a ghost is, uh, anything that is not in physical form. And that can be uh, a soul who has transitioned but came back to say hello to loved ones or to uh, watch over grandchildren or spouses or, or things like that. That would be what you'd probably call a ghost. Uh, it's better to call them uh, demonic spirits or evil spirits than to call them ghosts because Ghosts can be negative or positive, but it's mostly positive. So how would they get revenge? 
those who are waiting to do revenge? One of the easiest ways they do it is they get somebody who is very easily influenced. And these spirits can attach themselves to physical beings or can even be taken into the body of physical beings if they are invited. And what, how this happens most of the time is you will get a person who is, they get drunk, they get inebriated and they say, oh, I am so lonely. I feel, I, I wish I had somebody with me. So the evil spirit says, okay, what a perfect invitation. Let me join you. And once inside the body of the host, they then start to influence their thoughts. Look at that person. They're making evil eyes at you. You should go slap them. So then they get this unknowing host to go up and start a fight with somebody. So they influence the physicalness of a person either by being inside of them or by giving such a strong energetic push to a person that they do something that would be out of character for them if they were in their own mind and they then can take revenge on someone else. Wow. Are Thank there you. many, many of those around now? Are we talking large numbers? They're spread throughout the planet. Um, there are, there, guides are telling me there are a number of them that are woven in and around the groups that have been causing most of the trouble. That was my question. Yeah, there, there's some in um, the white supremacist, some in the survivalist, some in the brotherhood. Um, pardon? QAnon. Oh, definitely QAnon. And the thing with groups such as QAnon, the people who take and subscribe to those broadcasts are asking, what should I do? The majority of people in the United States, well, not the majority because it's shifting. The majority of people though have always wanted to be told what to do. It's easier if you're told what to do. If somebody tells you what to do, no matter what you do, you're not to blame for it because you only did it because they told you to. Isn't that the excuse that all of the bad guys use? Well, I only did it because I was ordered to do it. That's what the police officers are saying and everything else. I only did it because I was told to do it. So if you are a person who just follows what everybody else tells you to do, you aren't responsible. So you think, but you are responsible because you have freedom of choice to listen and to obey and to do what they want you to do. Wow. Thank you. Um, there's been a lot of questions about climate. I'm going to, to uh, give you uh, one here. Uh, how do the animal people, plant people, stone people, and Mother Earth herself feel about humans' aggression against the planet? And how can humans atone, so to speak? Mother Earth is a living, breathing entity, and it is comprised of all of the things that make up the planet and grow on the planet. Mother Earth weeps. We think of it, or we call it a she, because it cares for everyone, and that is more of feminine characteristic than a, a male characteristic. We can change, we can help the earth if we acknowledge that we share this space with the planet. We're not the 
the controller of this planet. People think because they control their houses that they can control the planet like they control the house that they have constructed to live in. But that's not the truth because a house doesn't live. A house is made up of things that have been converted to create a living space for you. Planet Earth continues to evolve. It rotates. It has a pulse within it, the core, the lava. It has a surrounding energy, the winds, the solar flares, the things that impact it. And we can do things to protect it or to destroy it. To protect the planet from the constant bombardment of solar flares and things like that, we have to maintain the ozone level so that the energy as it comes down doesn't impact the earth, but bounces off and goes back into space. We have been destroying that by the increase of carbon monoxide and dioxide in the atmosphere. That comes from the con consumption of fossil fuels and the other things that we have done through our lifestyles on the planet. We can change all of that, but we first have to acknowledge that it exists. The biggest problem with having any change in climate right now is the huge number of people who think that it's a myth. And they think it's a myth because if they acknowledge that it's truth and that we are destroying the environment, then big business is going to have to change the way they do things. And that means they're going to have to put their own money into abatement of the destructive characteristics. And they don't wanna do that. They want every dollar to go into their pockets and into the pockets of the congressmen that they pay to keep them from having to be regulated. So again, we have to decide what type of reality do we wanna live in? And we have to speak that truth to ourselves and to those around us and to those who represent us. Terry, you made a point that I think most of us feel very, I don't wanna say hopeless, but it's like the, a conundrum. You just stated what, you know, the ultra wealthy pay the Congress to do their bidding. So given that they are in complete in the back pocket, so to speak, how do we undo that since we aren't going to have the money or influence that they do to get Congress to vote to require a bait? Just like there are beginning to be grassroots programs that are helping to equalize the voting rights of the people in the South, particularly in Georgia. Stacey Abrams is a perfect example of what can be done by one person speaking her truth and letting people know. But on an energetic basis, this is another way that we can send love energy to those people so that they understand they are not the movers and shakers for the planet. Only their money is. And if we send them love so that they understand that they can create something different than they've been working on, we can start to move them. Another question. Um, a, a person asked uh, for someone to address the climate crisis. 
and asks if it can be averted at this point, and you've addressed that to some degree. And then another question related, is this parallel to the later times of Atlantis? Can it be averted? Yes, it can. Can it be averted easily? No. It has to be done gradually, and it has to be done with the consent of a majority of the world. Getting back into the climate consortium will start to direct the United States in the right direction. It, it can't be done immediately. And it, there's so many people talking right now. What was the second part of your question? Because it just. Um, if this is uh, parallel to the later times oh, of Atlantis. No. What happened in Atlantis is that they developed mind energy where they had cold fusion and a number of things that were uh, different ways of producing energy. And they became a little bit too impressed with themselves and what they could do and they ended up blowing themselves up. Was that a, like a, a bomb? It created like a bomb because it was uh, cold fusion just disintegrates things and, and causes it to uh, go into its essential forms. So it, it, we're not anywhere near that because we aren't as progressive as they are with understanding the power of the human soul and the power of the human energy. We think that everything has to be physical and it doesn't. So we don't have to worry about that happening to uh, anybody within the lifetime of any of us here. Another question. Um, Deborah asks, after death, will I be compelled to encounter people that I don't want to see? Absolutely not. After death, you do what you want to do. You create what you want to create. You, every soul has a consul, and it's 12 other souls who are sort of like your best buds, and you bounce ideas off of them, and they help you make uh, decisions. They don't make any decisions for you, but they give you all of the possibilities and everything else. Now, people that you have known in this physical lifetime, you may not even see them in that physical existence on the other side, because they may have been having a lifetime that they didn't particularly enjoy. So they want to go back to their ultra loving, unconditional loving self. And then you will say, oh man, didn't we plan a weird, get together down there. And yeah. you may see them, but you won't see them as the person that you would recognize being here in this physical existence. But you can still recognize them. If you choose to, it's like, uh, recognize, you don't have eyes, you only have feelings. So you feel them and you see them as you wanna see them. You may see them as the person that you made the agreement with before you came down here, before they assumed the body that you had dealings with here on, on planet Earth. Uh, you may see them as a person that you had spent another lifetime with in that particular costume. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Freedom of choice exists here on this planet for everything we do. But in energetic form, freedom of choice is even greater because you get to choose where you wanna be, who you wanna be with, how you wanna be seen, what you wanna do. And you create the reality that you interpret, that you exist in. Someone uh, asked, 
for advice on connecting to loved ones on the other side from here, from now? Well, the the definition loved ones has many meanings for a soul. Considering the fact that each soul has hundreds of lifetimes during its existence as a soul. A person who is a physical loved one in life A, you may make an agreement with them to be your worst enemy in life B. When you then go home after life C, which person do you interact with? Your physical loved one or your worst enemy? It's the same person. So to say that you have loved ones and enemies is a misnomer. It's something that exists in a physical form, but not in a spiritual energetic form. And that's very difficult for us to understand because the intensity of the physical love that we experience on earth, which is the only place that we can experience that because without a body in a spiritual form, we can't experience a physical love. We only have an unconditional love for the other spirits that we're on the spiritual plane with. Wonderful. Um, uh, you, hello. You mentioned uh, that uh, we are not. Uh, hi. You mentioned hi. that we, you are. You are to ask uh, questions oh. on chat, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, a, a question from Bob. There have been an alarming number of businesses that are now going out of business, including a large number of major companies. And also, now that a number of people are now working remotely and and are abandoning major buildings in large cities. How are cities going to survive? When the tax base leaves, how can cities survive? Where are people going to be able to work? There are a lot of different things that are going to have to change. In order for the United States to come into an equilibrium they're going to have to take a look and see what a number of the Scandinavian and the European countries have done to support their businesses, to support their people so that things are changed. The completion when we get there of the COVID pandemic is going to be very much akin to what we experience after the world wars, nothing is going to be able to get back to what it was in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, or 2020. Nothing, because everybody has changed. Some things have been adapted so that they are much better than they were before, some of the way that, that business is done, but also the way that people are utilized within industries has changed and is going to change even more. People can't just bury their head in the sand and say, I'm only going to come out when things are the way they were when I felt comfortable about them. We've got to take a look and we've got to be proactive. We have got to let other people know what changes can be made, what our needs are, what our minimum requirements are. The whole problem is that with major industries, they have gotten so comfortable and one of the biggest changes is going to be within the pharmaceutical industry. 
look at the millions and millions and millions of dollars they have been provided to develop vaccines, even in the development stage before they knew they were going to develop a vaccine. The government paid them millions and millions of dollars. There has to be some type of a judgment based upon that as to how that is distributed throughout the United States, not just among the major suppliers, the major stockholders and everything of those companies, not just the congressmen that were smart enough to go out and buy the stock when they heard what was gonna happen. And that is up to us. That is up to us to know what we need, to accept that things are gonna change. How many restaurants do we need? How many fast food places do we need? We have been flooded with comfort things for us because we were in a position to be able to afford them. Look at what happened during the world wars when people got used to rationing and people got used to doing jobs that they wouldn't normally have done because they were needed. There has to be a shift in thinking for us to get back to some type of an equilibrium. There's no easy answers and it's going to involve a lot of people, but there are, you can see changes occurring already. So as long as we get it into our heads that things aren't going to be the way they were before, the easier we'll be able to see how we can shift our own thinking to develop what we need and what everybody else needs. Wow. So much, so much going on. Um, a question, uh, with the country so divided, is a civil war imminent? No, it's not imminent. Is there going to continue for a while to be a divide? Yes. Is it going to be sustainable? And it won't be sustainable because of the needs of all of the people. Those that want to divide the country, I think it was what I had the senators who were talking about the new division of the, the states, they wouldn't know how to take care of themselves because they have had everything provided for them. And those that are talking about division aren't thinking ahead as to where they're gonna get their food sources, where they're gonna get their fuel, where they're going to be able to bank or anything else. It is all just wishful thinking. One of the things that uh, the spirits on the other side find so uh, interesting is how a number of these people talk the same talk that is talked in the role player games on the, the different toy systems where you create your own government, you create your own tribes and everything else. But everything is always available for you. It has no basis in reality. And these people who are talking this division, there's no basis in reality. They're thinking it's as easy as going into a role-playing computer game and creating a new existence with no foundation of who's gonna 
give you water? Who's going to give you fuel? Who's going to give you food? And once they realize that, they're going to come together like puppies with their tail between their legs and say, Mommy, may I come home? Yes. Wonderful. That's very interesting. Question. United States sends billions of dollars in foreign aid. What prevents our Congress to provide for its own people? Well, they are providing quite a bit, you know, with the with the first buyout bill and with the ones that uh, are right now languishing on Mitch McConnell's desk. Uh, they are going to provide a lot for ourselves. The position that the United States has taken in the world of helping other people may change. And it may change based upon the fact of the needs at home. Again, based upon the way the United States was after the Second World War. While we did a lot to help rebuild different places in Europe, the main thing we were concerned about was taking care of things that are here at home. The realization that that is a necessity is going to hit home. And it is going to be very aware within the realms of the people who are proposed to be in positions of power and judgment in the coming administration. If you take a look at the nominees that have been suggested, most of them are people who have gone through one or another disaster within their lifetime have been in a position of power and of being the ones who made the decisions of how things were allotted within those times of difficulty. So that they are forewarned and forearmed to be in a position to adjust so that the United States takes care of its own first and then if there is any supplementation that can be done, it will be done. How can the United States heal relationships with enemies such as Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea? What can we do to stop US aggression in the world? Well, that's two different things. Right. Aggression in the world has to do with if you accept the belief systems of other people or if you just think everybody else but you is wrong. That's what aggression is. Aggression is believing that you're the only one that's right and everybody else is wrong. You can disagree with what somebody does and yet not say that they are totally against you. The first thing we have to do is we have to talk and we have to listen. And we have to do it on an even footing, not from a point of, I'm the big guy, you're the small guy, and I'm gonna tell you what to do. We have to try to understand what the other people are saying, what the other people want. And then at the same time, be very honest with them. We cannot agree with what you are doing. We cannot support what you are doing, but we would still like to maintain a communication line with you so that we don't go after each other's throats. It is going to be impossible with the history that has occurred recently for us to reverse 
the gulfs that have been created with certain countries, such as Russia, China, Iran. Uh, there is just so much that has occurred. They're not going to believe an olive branch means that we just want to talk. They're going to believe it's an olive branch that we're ready to turn into a switch to beat them with. So we're going to have to do it with diplomacy. And thankfully, there are enough diplomats still around who have history with those people and within those cultures, that they have a credibility that will help rebuild some of the bridges that have been taken down piece by piece. Thank you. Uh, are you able to find out what Nelson Mandela thinks about the current South Africa? I'm not talking to him directly, but I'm getting a message through from him that he weeps for some of it because he sees two steps back lately or one step forward. But he still has faith that there are enough people who will mount a campaign that that can be reversed again. Um, are you able to find out uh, what Mother Teresa thinks about the ability of love to grow, continue to grow on the earth? Well, she is always about love. Mm -hmm. And she of all people fought on this earth to be able to feel love because she, during her time here, she wasn't sure what love was. So she thought that it was just giving to others and didn't understand that love loving yourself was very important. And she would like to see all people that you can only love another person to the extent that you love yourself. And that doesn't mean a physical love, but it means an appreciation and an acceptance of who you are, what you are accomplishing by being on this earth what you are sharing with others and where you are going. And the more you send love to others, as a number of other people have said today, the more love there will be on the earth. We all have a core of unconditional love. Take the shackles off, let that open up, let that shine out so that when somebody meets you on the street, they don't see a scowl. Of course, it's gonna be behind a mask, but they don't see this masked stranger of, of negativity. They see this bright beam of love that is sharing the experiences that come from accepting your inner self, your inner love, and letting it flow out to others to help them ignite the love inside of them. And if each person does that, we will multiply the love that is on the planet. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, are you able to uh, tell um, what Abraham Lincoln feels about the current status of race relations in the un United States? Well, through weeping for the setbacks that have occurred, he also is very heartened by the fact that for every demonstration that has occurred for Black Lives Matter, it has been, but to a large degree, almost as many whites 
and other races participating with the acceptance that all men are created equal, just as he preached, just as he said, and as he believes can happen with the way people are understanding they have a say in what has happened. There have been demonstrations occurring in this period of 2020 like have not occurred since before the civil rights movement or even during the civil rights movement to the degree that they are occurring now. So he is encouraged that the voice of the people is being heard. There are more people of non-color that are fighting to get the black vote out, to get the Latino vote out, to get the Native American vote out that are being done by people of those races because the whites believe in that principle that all men are created equal. And for that, Abraham Lincoln said he will stand on any soapbox anywhere and applaud and cheer as they march by. Wow. What do the indigenous leaders of America feel is still needed in order to shift the energy of American of America from fear to love? Well, they look at it two different ways. They look at it that the first thing that has to happen is that everyone has to understand their connection to the planet. That it is in loving the planet and as the life source of all humanity, nothing can change until we take care of it. Secondarily, they see that just as various religions are given their own rights to represent their backgrounds as their religion dictates, that people should understand that the religious aspects of Native Americans is their lifeblood. And it shouldn't be belittled. It shouldn't be uh, taken as being a big joke. They are very heartened by what has been happening with uh, particularly major universities acknowledging that the symbolism that they considered Native American was very, it was demonizing Native Americans to a large extent. And that having them as mascots, as jokes, as playthings was doing a disservice to them, like taking our most honored representatives and saying we can use an effigy of them as a mascot and kick it around. So they see a big change occurring, but there also has to be a parity as far as uh, providing for the Native Americans. We stole their land. We have given them small sections of land and told them they can be totally autonomous within those reservations. But we have not shared the wealth of the United States with them. We have not given them medical help. We have not given them utilities. We have said, it's your own autonomous land. You can have, uh, you can sell cigarettes, you can have uh, casinos, you can do what you want, but then you have to pay for your own 
itself. There has to be some equation explained as to why various things are divided the way they are and an explanation done for Americans, the non-Native Americans that think that they are the country. You, I, all of us. And give to the Native Americans what we have. What is part of our natural inheritance. There's still a lot of discontent among the, the uh, Native Americans because of what has happened. Uh, a very good example is, is what happened out west in, in the current pandemic, where they just didn't have the medical treatment, they didn't have the hospitals, there was a higher <laughs> death rate. There was a higher death rate with the Native Americans than there were in rural Black communities. And that has to be acknowledged by the rest of us. Sarah asks if uh, some of us have had visions of people living much differently than today, in, I presume in the future, in smaller sustainable communities in, in the maybe near future after the breakup of large cities. Please address this, including when this might possibly occur. Well, that's all freedom of choice. There are those that are already doing that. There are communities that have become self-sustaining. Uh, it all depends upon, again, what each individual's reality wants to include. If your reality wants to sustain what you're used to now, having Netflix, Disney Plus, and you know, 120 TV channels, uh, having your iPad that you read off of constantly instead of uh, breaking the spine of a good book, uh, being able to uh, go to the corner fast food place and not have to cook a day in your life, that's one way to exist. Another way to exist is to be self-sustaining, to feel the earth, to feel your connection with the earth, to talk to it, to grow what you want to eat and to live by your own wits. So there are a number of people that are doing that now. There are communities breaking off that are doing that. There's uh, a number in uh, down in Indiana. There's a bunch of more over in Ohio. And it just depends upon what you want to do. The Amish have done that to a degree for years and their communities are still flourishing. So it just depends upon how each person sees their future and what creature comforts they want. Will there be peace in the Middle East? Too many variables. Seems like the, the history of the world, there's never really been peace there. Well, you have to take into consideration that there is an equal amount of negative energy and positive energy. So for every positive, loving community, there has to be one at war. Because you can't unbalance the negative and the positive on planet Earth. So there will never be a time when the entire Earth is at peace. And another reason is because when souls come down here to learn things, they learn through negativity. 
when we are at home in unconditional love, there's nothing but positive loving energy. And you can't learn if everything's perfect. The only way you can learn something is if you have the opposite of perfect, understand it's the opposite of perfect, and then try to return it to perfection. Hi. So Hi. there will always be as many negative things on the planet as there are positive. Bob asked, um, please keep your uh, voices muted. Um, from Bob says, from what you said about having to adapt and the implication of having to accept less, doesn't this imply a major depression is coming? Not necessarily. Think about things and think about a person who has the best of everything. They have the best beef, the best fruit, the best salads, the best of everything. And then there's one step down where there is very nutritious meat, vegetables, and fruits, but not the absolute best. There might be a bruise here or there. And then under that, there is the sustainable food. What do you need? Will you be sustained with the adequate food? And if you have enough adequate food, is that a depression? No. What it is, is it is less than being in the maybe top 2% as far as being able to get everything you want. And maybe you're going to have to cook your own food instead of having a chef come in and cook for you. But that doesn't necessarily mean a depression. That only means that you may not have the best of the best. And that is, again, they're, they're harping back to, that is what we faced after World War II when we started coming out of the rationing, the pound of meat a week. Mar the margarine that you had to color with, with little capsules of food coloring. It is learning to accept what you need and not of what you desire. Doesn't mean a depression. It just doesn't mean gold plated everything. No gold-plated toilets. No gold-plated toilets. Um, <laughs> Clara asks, what education for primary, middle, and high schools look like in the future? Will there, will there be changes? Or are we, we still going to have similar structures? There's a lot of variables being discussed about that at this time. It appears that the tendency right now is that education is going to return to what it was similar to uh, prior to the COVID. It has been definitely determined that socialization is a very important part of the educational process. The amount of supplemental education which will be done through electronic means will probably be sustained because that has provided a depth to education within some corners that they've never seen before. It goes much beyond what one teacher with one group of, of students can provide. So it will probably be a mixture depending upon what each educational uh, union votes 
because it, it again then comes down to the unions and what they think is the best thing for the kids. Um, in the beginning, you said John Lewis was willing to speak or yes. to questions. Um, I would I would love to know what's on his mind at this point in time, watching what we've been going through these last few weeks. Well, he's having trouble not laughing hysterically. <laughs> because he is saying that what has happened is more a slapstick comedy routine <laughs> than anything that could have ever been envisioned during the Marx Brothers uh, tenure. That the audacity of some of the, he calls them writers, of what has happened, the, the lawsuits, the uh, stalwartness of stupidity that has been maintained, the uh, 101 legislators who wanted to invalidate the election, which reelected most of them, which would have invalidated their elections. He said it is just too absurd to have envisioned somebody could write something like that. He is encouraged with the fights that are going on and with the determination of particularly the younger voters. He has seen such a strong base developing with people who are no longer getting into politics because it's part of the family business, but are doing it because they see the rightness of correcting the inequities. And he applauds them from on top of high. He knows that a number of these people give him credit. And he said, he isn't the credit. He was just the show one. There has to be someone who was a way shower and he provided the way, just as Jesus the Christ provided the way to show humanity and love. He was happy to be the way shower to show that all men are created equal. And he can see nothing but great changes and great things happening in the next period of time. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, 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 attendee said, uh, you mentioned that uh, we wouldn't in our lifetime have the mind advances like Atlanta's, but she said she felt, felt that many people are advancing mind ability now. Uh, uh, in Very definitely. There are those that are doing it. There are those that are uh, putting their efforts into it. What we meant when we said that is there is not going to be a whole community, a whole population, such as the size of Atlantis, which was uh, like 500,000 people all gathered in one spot devoted to mind control. There are small segments of people are working with that and developing that. And there are a lot of individuals developing those abilities. So it is out there, it is a possibility. All souls have the ability to do it within their physical bodies. They just have never spent the time to do it. But yes, it is there. We just meant that there would not be uh, a consensus of people gathering together to try to create uh, a life force and energy force as the Atlanteans did that resulted in the blowing up of the population. Great, thank you. Linda asks, what about doc, uh, what Dr. Bruce Lipton and Greg Braden talk about that we are in the sixth period of extinct, extinction? Uh, 
everybody has to have a belief system. Those gentlemen believe that from their scientific backgrounds, and they both have scientific backgrounds, that what they are seeing and the decline in certain circumstances and the acceleration in other circumstances has created uh, a cyclic diminution of prosperity and other things. And that's fine, that's their belief system. Just as some people believe there is no such thing as an afterlife, and some people believe there is no such thing as being able to talk to spirits. And just like some people believe that there is no fair election, it's what your belief system is. It doesn't have to be accepted by anybody but those who feel that it's true. And if it resonates within you, then it's your belief. Pay attention. Pay attention to how it feels. Right. Um, Linda asks if, um, the, the, she says, many of the spirits crossed over many years ago. Are, are they also living in a physical body at, at this time? Can they be talking to you on the other side and be in a physical body? Once a, an energy leaves the physical body here, it has an option of what it wants to do. Most of the time, it just assumes its energetic form so that it is not restricted to being located in only one spot. An energetic body can split itself up and be present in many, many different places all at the same time. If it chooses to secrete itself into a physical body, it is very difficult for its concentration to be split to a number of different locations because it has to spend the energy maintaining that physical existence. Since energy has no physical existence, it has to use a majority of its energy to create a shell that it can, is contained within. What it is more liable to do is to recall the energy that a person in another physical body may have felt in its presence when it was in its physical body and portray that energy to the individual. Now, once on the other side, when people come back and visit those that they have left behind, they may give an odor that you would associate with that person, like with a gentleman, a certain pipe tobacco, or with uh, a woman, uh, a certain floral essence, or a cooking essence, chocolate chip cookies or brownies or, or something like that, rather than try to project the body, which takes so much more energy. On the other side, they would be associating not only with those that they just recently had shared physical experiences with, but with souls from other time frames that they shared existences with who would not recognize the body that they just left because it was a prior time and a prior body. So then again, it's much easier for them to just give a sense of the energetic essence of that body. So there aren't too many of them who maintain a physical body on the other side. It's not impossible, but it restricts what they can do. So they're, they're not as likely to do it as they are to just be energetic and send out feelers of their exchange with that other soul. What would Thomas Jefferson have to say about the legacy of enslaved persons in the USA and today's racial climate? I ask a similar question from 
somebody else, but not from Thomas Jefferson. Well, Jefferson was at one time a slaveholder. He also But once he understood more about people, he freed his slaves and emancipated all of those in any way, shape or form. He sees that a lot of what is happening now is the thought process of some of those slave holders but not as much of the slaveholders who saw them only as property, but of those who were the overseers who saw only that they had a way that they could be superior to somebody they thought they're inferior. And that Racism is more about egotism than it is about anything else. It's about the egotistical thoughts and desires of the racist that they are better than <laughs> and cannot be equal by anyone who doesn't look exactly like them. It isn't about anything else. <laughs> it isn't about knowing anything about genetics or knowing anything about family histories or knowing anything about origins of species. It is nothing other than egotistical control over other people. What do your spirits say about the Course in Miracles? Is it accurate? The Course in Miracles gives a pathway for you to understand a lot of the innate abilities contained by a soul within a physical body. It is a pathway to using some of your powers in a way that seems very safe because it is recognized by so many people and so many groups. It is a starting point. It is not an ending point. It is a way that you can see what feels good to you what you want to create your reality from and that there are no limits on you if you have belief in yourself and if you tap into your spiritual, unconditionally loving, fantastic, godlike energy. But it is not something which should restrict you to the words in the book. It should be a launching pad for you in knowing yourself, developing yourself, and helping the world. We have a, a question here. Um, where to go? Um, would you say the earth is in balance now? No. No, it, it's, it's getting more and more out of balance uh, because of the amount of garbage that's being distributed throughout the planet. Uh, 
with the, the way part of the earth is accepting um, climate control and part of the planet is saying there isn't any and uh, build up a carbon monoxide in part of the planet and the uh, willowing it down in other parts of the planet. No, it, it's wobbling. And until the whole planet joins together and becomes of one mind as to what to do about climate control, it will continue to be out of balance. That's why we are seeing the shift in all of the storms, the shift in the uh, degree of moisture, the, uh, all the forest fires, that is, they're all indications of the planet being out of balance. So a lot has to do with the climate situation. Very definitely. Um, uh, Kathleen asked us a partial question. She said, is there anything you can tell us that is not a possibility, but something you know for sure? but she doesn't say about what, because that's a pretty broad question. But um... all I can say, or all we can say for sure, is there are no absolutes. So that's kind of answering the question, but at the same time, the exact opposite of what the question was. <laughs> Nothing is for positive because every single solitary soul on this planet as freedom of choice. And if they decide that they are going to do something the opposite of what they planned on doing, it's going to change everything. And that'll change the next person down the line and the next person down the line. So there are no absolutes. And there's no right or wrongs because everything can change. And what new energy sources will we have and how can we reduce the hold that the fossil fuel industries have on us through their control? Well, we haven't even begun to develop what is out there already. And that's solar power, wind power, uh, thermodynamic power, all of those powers are out there. And some countries are, are very, great with them. You, you go to uh, New Zealand, where they uh, use the energy of uh, all of the earthquake zones. You go to uh, Iceland, where they do the same thing. You go to uh, Holland, where they have, they have wind power. They have wind farms all over the place. Iowa, Indiana, here in the states that are, are developing wind power. And yet you go into major areas, there's nothing. In this Chicagoland area, how many solar panels have you ever seen? If any. And that would be so easy to take communities and put them on the roofs and use them as ha they have done in many parts of Europe. I was in Singapore 20 years ago and they used solar panels to heat hot water. We have not done anything other than let major industries tell us what to do. In this area, Commonwealth Edison tells us how we're going to get our power. Are we going to get it from coal plants? Are we going to get it from nuclear plants? Never say anything about solar or wind. As you drive across Illinois and you see all of the wind farm to uh, Iowa, they use have a large portion of wind power. Very easy to do in all the farmers fields in, in Illinois, but never done because that would go against the power plants. We have to get involved. We have to tell the people who make those decisions, which are the legislatures, what we would like them to look into. 
we have to understand, of course, you first have to understand that there is such a thing as climate control. <laughs> that uh, it, it's an important thing. And that's where we can not only let our opinions be known, but we can also energetically send that message out. Just like the Course in Miracles tells you how important your thoughts are and your desires and your wishes. Start sending out those things. Start sending out that love to get rid of the racism, that love to get rid of the Oh, the QAnon and uh, brothers and all of those people. Let your voice be heard. There have been a number of questions about um, the up upcoming administration and health insurance and health care. People are concerned that they have this. Um, is there any information there about that? Well, as the current administration is being formed, all of the people that are being put in positions of power are ones who have dealt with the last CARE Act. Yes. So they know what is needed to create a safe healthcare system for people. But it's going to depend upon, again, the composition of the legislatures and what will be able to be passed. The thing is, if enough people get their thoughts and facts out there the people who have just been the blind sheep being led by the Pied Pipers will begin to understand that what they have signed on to is not beneficial for them. And that they're going to have to jump that ship and get on board something that is going to provide for their needs. And then once those voices are added to the chorus, it's going to be much easier to provide something that will benefit everyone. Um, we have one last question here. Um, on December 21st, there will be a Saturn-Jupiter conjunction, which will produce what is being called the Christmas star. I actually, if I move over, you can see it. This is a, a current a photo of, of the almost conjunction that will be coming in the next few days. Um, the question is, does this mean something good is going to happen? Hmm. First, you have to describe what good means. Good in as far as people's moods go, good as far as providing for people's needs, good as far as getting rid of more negativity in the world. Good is defined by what you accept to be good. You can go out today and you can say, it's raining. That's good. <laughs> That's good because we haven't had much moisture for the last 21 days. But other people are gonna go out and they're gonna say, it's raining, I'm gonna get wet. So good is defined by your beliefs and what you accept. If you accept every day is good because it's another day you're on this planet, it's another day you're experiencing things, it's another day you get to make choices about how your world exists and every day is good. And even if you get a flat tire on your car, it's good.
because you weren't taking care of your car. You can look at everything as good or bad. I see every possibility of bringing my attention to something new as good because I'm learning something. I'm experiencing something. I am observing something that I have not observed before. And it's good because it increases my world. And my dog is saying it's good that the neighbor's walking their dog. <laughs> I feel so blessed, Tony, to do what I do and to be able to make contact with people like you and all of the people who attended today. Uh, it's, it's been, I've been doing this since May 98 every month. And um, I just feel like there's nothing better than to be able to do this kind of thing. And uh, we will be doing it on the, continue doing it on the second Saturday of every month online until we can do it back at Evanston Hospital. Next month, we will have a woman named Julie Papiavis who, who completely died and had a, a, a horrible accident. And she's written a wonderful book about it. She's a delightful person. She's gone from complete incapacity to be able to function again. And her story is very riveting and I hope you can all join us. Remember that um, if you have friends that you wish had seen this, you can go to our website and view it uh, starting tomorrow, Vicki, or starting tomorrow. And uh, our past online meetings, which are started in September are all online on our website under events videos. And there are about 80 of our videos available on YouTube. And you can access all of those through our website too. So website is a good place for lots of information. And um, we, uh, we want this information available for everyone. And so we don't charge admission, but we do have expenses and we request a donation of $20 when you come to the hospital. And, and we still need uh, to continue um, taking in some money to pay, pay things that we have to pay like the to, to send out the emails and to do this, that, and the other things still cost a lot of money. And so we are very grateful if you have to find it in your soul to uh, go to our website under donate and choose a way to send us a few bucks. Uh, we, we aren't hard after money. We, we've never been about collecting money. We just wanna pay our, pay our debt and be able to have enough to keep going. So, and uh, you're perfectly welcome to share the, this information with anyone. Uh, the idea is to educate the world because it's through education that the most change will happen. So again, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I hope that your holidays, whatever they are, are wonderful and that you're able to absorb as much love as possible and share as much love as possible. So and as my group always says, have a life filled with love, light, and plenty of laughter. Make it what you want it to be. Tony. And namaste all. Namaste. Tony, I, is there a way to connect with you for a reading? Uh, yes, you can email me. Uh, at my last name, Winninger, W-I-N-N-I-N-G-E-R, at gmail.com. Oh, it's there's three N's in your name, right? Three N's. Yes. And she's great. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Diane. You did a great job. And thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Diane, is there a way to give a love offering by Zell?
Yes. What is yes. the address? Oh, God. <laughs> I don't remember. It's on our website. Go to chicagoions.org. And up there's a list of things like events and about and so on and so forth. And one of them says donate. Click right. on donate. and It'll tell you how to do the Zelle and how you, how you can do mail it and how all different ways Terrific. that you can contribute. That, okay. That's the best way because I forget. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Diane, can you turn off the recording, please? I'll keep going and do that.